but you can see it says it has been recording and can you see that? Yes, it is being recorded at the moment. It's mm -hmm. not been recorded yet. Sorry, no, it's on pause. No, I oh, just, I okay. just, it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, now I, I really think we have to get on to saying something, otherwise we're going to spend the whole hour just talking about microphones. Um, so I'm going to suggest. <laughs> If everybody can hear me, I'm going to suggest that we start taking a few questions, and I think we might have to do this via writing on the part of, um, yes, okay, and that's absolutely fine. Nobody's microphone seems to be working fine. So let's take well, some written uh, things. And Natalia has wrote, written in a question. Yes. yes. So um, Natalia's question was, one of my concerns is how to teach pronunciation to beginners. Many teachers only focus on grammar and vocabulary and don't think pronunciation is that important. And I'm going to I'm going to shoot that off to Roz. Roz, what do you think about teaching pronunciation to beginners? I think it's absolutely essential. Of course, it's absolutely essential because we don't want them to get bad habits. And so, uh, if they just do anything in pronunciation, if they if they, for example, Spanish speech, speakers reading English will will give it uh, will will use a pronunciation that is just not at all suitable. They, they absolutely need pronunciation from the very, very beginning. And uh, so, yes, we do pronunciation from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Lesson one is pronunciation. In fact, the first couple of hours is pronunciation. Piers? Well, I was going to say, perhaps you could say something about sort of pr pr pronunci the pr a pronunciation intensive part of the course, because the thing about pronunciation is you need all of it from the very start. Grammar you can teach little bit by little bit, you can do it incrementally. Um, the thing is, any given sentence in English is, in, is potentially going to use all of pronunciation. So in fact, I th when certainly when Ros and I teach, and I, I suspect when Carrie teaches to some extent, um, we start off by doing pretty much only pronunciation to begin with, with beginners or with advanced students, until we feel that they have some idea about how the pronunciation system works. And at that point, we'll go on and do grammar and other sorts of things like that. But at least then they have the basis for saying anything they want to say. Yeah, and I would have thought that when you're, when you're teaching new Lexis, for example, you know, you have to teach a word with its stress pattern and with its, you know, pr characteristic pronunciation. Because with the English spelling system and pronunciation being somewhat more tenuously linked than, say, a phonetic language like Spanish, particularly, um, it's absolutely crucial. And um, and as Ros says, if you don't do that, then you can end up with fossilizing serious um, errors, and you end up with, as I have on frequent occasions, Spanish students who literally think that the word fruit is pronounced fruit, and friend is friend, and they have literally been pronouncing it like that in class and, and not being corrected. So after they've been practicing that for five or six years, rectifying um, that problem it takes a lot longer than teaching it correctly in the first place, I would have thought. Absolutely, and you're not sure of getting a good result, which is the other problem. No, we have right. Anne, for example, has said uh, the, the importance of pronunciation was, regret, was neglected for so long that it may be too late to change bad habits. Absolutely. This is, uh, for me, this is an, a really essential point. Uh, teachers should be teaching pronunciation. What can I do eight years after they've started learning? Well, it is possible to change. Um, hmm. That is possible. It's very difficult, but uh, because it requires. Sorry, Piers. Piers. I was going to say I'd interrupt. We haven't actually answered Natalia's question. Can we? Could, Natalia's question was how. There was two parts of it. One was it a good idea, and we we certainly said it should. But her other question was how does one deal with it with beginners? Is how do you teach pronunciation to beginners? Would you like to um, <laughs> say anything about that? Yes, that's rather difficult because we're only in week two, right? And all that we have to do, um, well, we have to, working on pronunciation, sounds are not the first thing. As you'll see, um, as we get into week three, uh, there's a summary of week three at the end of week three where Piers goes back over all that we've done in weeks one, two, and three. And you'll see that there's uh, speech breathing, there is articulatory settings, which is coming in the next, next um, week, week three. And, and uh, these have to be done before we begin sounds. And then in week four, we'll be dealing with sounds. So when I'm working with students, 
we start with sounds and well we start with we need a few sounds to begin with and so i usually start with say five the five long vowels in english and then i go on to a few consonants and then we start working on these other aspects that's to say we start working on speech breathing and we start working on articulatory settings which are coming and then i can add to the sounds as we go but I'm, what i'm trying to build is a, is a coherent whole uh, which is um, the sounds using speech breathing and using the articulatory setting. This takes about three hours or two hours or three hours, depending on who the students are. If the students come from a language which is extremely foreign, uh, Vietnamese, for example, or Chinese, um, then it would take a little more time. If they come from French or German, it takes less time might take two hours so we have a, a two hour marathon on pronunciation and then i can start doing the rest of the the um the the grammar and all that kind of thing and i can keep coming back to pronunciation every time we do a sentence i put it up on my fingers like this uh so that each each finger is a word if you like and uh, that way i can get them to change the grammar and then we put it all together with the correct pronunciation so every sentence is said with correct pronunciation and uh, this really works quite well as a system i think that, natalia i think you know the answer to the question of how we do how we would start with beginners i think that might be a better question for say week four because at the moment we haven't yes. done week the next week is going to be articulated settings. In week four, we're going to be talking about how we teach sounds. If you could hold that question and ask us that question again in week four or week five, we'll be able to give you a much better answer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth now, wants to say on. something about... No, wait a minute. Elizabeth has something to say about uh, fossilized pronunciation. Yes, yes, absolutely. I want to bear witness um, as usual about my experience of this workshop, uh, because I happened to drop in quite by accident three years ago and followed the whole workshop. Now, I have lived in France for 40 years and my pronunciation was extremely fossilized. Now, following the whole thing, that's what uh, Rosalyn was trying to say was, yeah, it's a bit difficult to give the whole five weeks content in one uh, ten, 30 minute lecture. And, uh, but following the full five weeks, I could now do a French accent. It doesn't mean that I have integrated this French accent because, you know, yeah, my accent has been English. You understand that I'm speaking the other way around, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. My, my, my accent speaking English, speaking French is, is really too fossilized. But before learning about pronunciation with uh, Rosalind and Piers, I didn't know how to do a French accent. Whereas now, since I now know how to do it, I can do it. It's something that which I, in you know, I'm 60 years old. I've never been able to do it before, this five-week course. Okay, because I understood the system. Does that make sense? Mm. That's, that's a nice testimony. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elizabeth. I, um, uh, Donald just uh, made a well emphasised this this issue about fossilised errors and um, with with a yes a favourite of mine with my Spanish students as well although I don't find it that often Donald but uh, that's a, that's an interesting one the G um, preceding the W sound um, or instead of the W sound and um, I think that the best way in my experience to sort of negotiate that is something yes that we haven't really looked at yet which is in week three which is articulatory setting because people just do not know that they're trying to produce the sound physically in a completely different way from the way the sounds produced so they're, re they're 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 looking at the letter and they're associating it with the sound that that letter is associated with in their L1 um, without realizing that, that that letter is associated with A, a different sound, and B, well, by necessity, a completely different position. Um, so I think that's how to crack that one, really, in my experience. And if you hang around for week three, you'll see what I mean. <laughs> Yes, and then hang around for week four when we're dealing with how you actually teach sounds, and uh, I think it, things will be much clearer for you. Hmm? 
we have a question yes. from Ivy. Can we go on there, or is that is well, it? Does anyone have any? Wait a minute, no, please. I'm, I'm not audible. I'm, sorry, go on. I was going to say I don't think we've quite dealt enough with fossilization, the issue of fossilization. People are saying we've had a couple of questions about it. how do you change bad habits? How do you change? You know, somebody's been doing eight years after they've been learning, and I think the yes. answer to that question. Um, is going to be how does one change any habit, any motor skill, pronunciation of the motor skill, how does one change something that you've integrated and because, which has become automatic and now which you want to change? Um, and the answer has to be, I think it's a very simple answer, but it applies to pronunciation. The answer has to be that you have to make people present. People have to become present to what it is they're actually doing and what it is they need to do. When they're present to that, they can start remaining present to that when they're actually doing, they can practice that for themselves. And gradually the process of practice means that it becomes automatic again. So they have to revisit what they would do, revisit the, the, the basic level of um, whatever they're doing, the motive level, and then change it. And all of the mm. things you've seen so far in this session so far, have been about us trying to make people more sensitive to what they're actually doing. Not the sound of what they're doing, yeah. but what they're physically doing, because that's the only way they're going to change pronunciation Absolutely. because it is a motor skill. Absolutely. And, and it can be such a revelation. I mean, I had that this morning with a student and I just said, you know, your ING endings, where are they finishing? Where is your tongue? And of course, her tongue was on her alveolar ridge because they were finishing with an N instead of an N. And I said, well, you know, your tongue isn't, you know, it, it's a completely different part of your tongue doing something different in a different place. And it was such a revelation to her because, you know, people don't, haven't necessarily even contemplated this before. Right. You know? Well, the whole training is against contemplating this, isn't it? If you can't hear it, well, listen a bit closer, listen better, listen better. And, and mm. the, the problem is, what should they be doing? Now, there's another Actually, aspect that I'd like to bring in on this, which is that, um, like, like learning any sport, in fact, there are moments when you, when you have a coach and you practice with the coach, and the coach tries to show you to do this or that or move something, do it a little bit differently. And that is one aspect of it. And um, in pronunciation, our job is to be the, the coach, if you like. And while you're having a lesson with the coach, you're not in a match. And in pronunciation, the equivalent of a match, of course, in, uh, in language is you actually need to go out and speak to somebody. That's, that's the equivalent of a match, where, where your job is to be with the person, not to be with your strokes. Right. And so uh, the pronunciation teaching should be divided into two parts. One part is this coaching. And, and while the coaching is going on, you're concentrating on all the things that you should be doing. And that's and then you get to the end of that lesson, you go off and you have a conversation with somebody. And little by little, this, the tennis strokes that you give yourself come into the game and the pronunciation strokes, if you like, the pronunciation movements will gradually come into uh, what you say. But when you're having a conversation, my goodness me, you're not present to what you're actually doing. You're present to the person that you're speaking to. So this is two different do you moments, want to, entirely different moments. Do you want to mention, I know we haven't got to that part of the of the session yet, but um, do you want to just mention how a performance piece can help bridge the gap between practicing the phoneme in isolation and then kind of actually integrating it into your everyday speech? Well, you could say something about that, Carrie. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to remember when when performance piece, which we In week in. three. It's in week three. Week three, mm -hmm. okay. Well, it, it, yes. it's just something, it's, it's a proverbial, you know, perennial problem is, yes, my student can produce the sound perfectly, uh, in a controlled environment, but then how are they going to automatize that? How is that going to become part of their everyday delivery of English in connected rapid speech? Well, obviously, it doesn't happen overnight. And, um, you know, being present to what they're doing and all of the things that Ros was just saying are, are crucial. And one of the things that we've integrated into the, into the, the TPD session is the idea of a performance piece. So you give your students something that bears repetition, something that they like. It could be a piece of poetry, nothing too long, part of a speech. And, and Ros has produced a compendium of, of suggestions that they could equally well come up with their own. And they literally just work on that until it's sort of picture perfect, if you like, until everything is smooth and connected and sounds like authentic English. And that then gradually percolates into the rest of their language. 
the idea is that uh, that then informs the rest of your speech. Are, and um, yes, and it takes time. It takes the time it takes. But uh, you can get the students to, it, they have to do the work. You can't do the work for them. They have to do the work. And, and so um, all you can do is give them the tools that they need. And then it might take them years. In, in, for my French, for example, it took me years to speak really good French. And then, you know, I finally got it. And, uh, and there we went. That was fine. Mm -hmm. But it of did course, take a long was, time. Yeah. And one of the reasons that you were successful, I, Ros, is because you really wanted it. And that is the other thing that someone has to really want it because it does take a lot of effort. And and if you don't, if you're not really committed, it it won't happen. In my experience, if you, take, if, you, if you take the piano player who plays once a week, who goes off to an hour's lesson and and plays and then comes home and doesn't practice, well, they won't make as much progress as somebody who comes home and practices half an hour a day. Exactly. Clearly, pronunciation is exactly the same. If you put in the time and and you know what to do, you'll get a result. If you put in the time but you don't know what to do, you won't get necessarily a result. Mm -hmm. Piers, you were going to um, say something in response yeah, so, to Donald? Uh, so just to, uh, I was I was going to do that. I was going to summarise that, and I was just going to say, look out next week, everybody, for the performance piece, because the way to bridge, as Ros and Carrie have been saying, the way the bridge between controlled practice in the classroom and spontaneous, beautiful, automatic speech um, when you're having a conversation is, we think, the best bridging for that is what we call the performance piece. And next week, in week three, there will be um, there will be much more about that. Yes, I was going to say something to Donald about cross-fertilization, wasn't I? Um, let me just, yes, um, where are we? Uh, what was Donald saying? Um, so you took the W, so this was a problem with getting wood, your Spanish speakers to say wood, and you were getting the W I from mean, white, uh... and then you were getting, getting to put it on, put it onto the, the back of wood, and um, it, was, it worked by the sound of it, but it didn't work as quickly as you were hoping it would work. Um, yeah, does anybody have any thoughts about that, Ros, Carrie? <sighs> no, not I really. Think it's it's a, it's practice makes perfect. Yeah, uh, it, it's not something that you get just like that. It's not instantaneous, uh, and they have to they have to be able to do their work worse sound in all sorts of contexts. Uh, mm. One thing that you might do, as far as stuttering is concerned, is make a little sentence like "We were working." So you have the the stresses on work. And so, and then you stutter it twice, and you get we were, we were, we were working, for example, we were working, and that might help them. Uh, it might help them to discipline themselves to be able to say it in those circumstances, for example. Mm. Chari, you wanted to say something too, I think. No, I, I, I think um, it, it's about making sure that they can produce that work in all, all the various environments that they might find it. So sticking it in front of all sorts of vowel sounds and maybe yeah creating sentences or, or tongue twisters or whatever where you're going to be reproducing it uh, in a number of contexts and then just I, I, I'm wondering if they've um, do you do they do they do it with wood and wood w double o d it's not just an association thing because sometimes these there are these weird associations that students have and not even realizing that would, W-O-O-D, is the same pronunciation as the modal There's... verb. Uh, so you no. might just double check that they can't do a perfectly good would. <laughs> Elizabeth has put a beauty in. in. Wi-Fi was working. Mm -hmm. Wi-Fi was working. So there you've got another one. Hmm? Would yes, the Wi-Fi um, work? <laughs> Does the Wi-Fi work? Mm -hmm. Would yes. the Wi-Fi um, work in a word? Was, and again, we'll talk about more. About... Sorry, I didn't okay, hear what you I... said, Piers. Okay. What is one thing I was going to mention was in week four, we're going to be talking about sounds. And the distinction we're going to make is between something which we consider to be a sound and something which we consider to be a noise. Now, you can be doing exactly the same thing. Um, but one aspect of learning new sounds and perhaps of controlling sounds in different environments is to start to try to get your students, and of course you if you're doing it yourself, to reconceive 
what they're doing as being a noise making activity rather than a sound making activity. When a noise is given linguistic significance, we call it a sound. But sometimes that can be a real barrier because then we link it into our whole rest of our linguistic system. Whereas sometimes we have to bring it back to just being a noise. What is the noise they're making when they're making a whir? You know, listen, get them to listen to it as a noise. And one way to listen to it as a noise is just to make it longer. If you if you start making either repeating a noise or making a noise longer, it sort of denatures. It stops being you stop recognizing it as a sound within English or a sound within Spanish or whatever. And you hear it just for what it is. And when you when when one conceives what one's doing as being a noise making activity, it, it then can be easier to put that noise in front of another noise. And of course, ultimately, mm. it's going to be two, we're going to consider being two sounds, one in front of another. But in fact, it would be the noise which you're making when you're making w, and you're putting that in front of ud, the noise you're making when you're making ud. Mm -hmm. mm. I think that comes into week four, where uh, once again we're uh, we're running out of. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, we're running out of ourselves a bit. Yes. I've written down Ivy's question because it's about to vanish off the top of the screen. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, it'll come in a moment. I'd just like to say to uh, Beatrice in Brazil, I'm not a great fan of tongue twisters, in fact, because I find tongue twisters difficult. And if I find tongue twisters difficult, well, then my students, surely, they would find them extremely difficult. I think uh, for me, it's better to use uh, much more ordinary sentences and which come straight out of the, uh, out of the language. Um, things like the stuttering version of uh, we were working, for example, where you can do work and then you can stutter the W, we were work, we were working, and you just put in a shui in, in we and then a schwa in, in work, we were working, but basically it's still a stutter. And this, this I find is better than going in for things like she sells, she sells on the seashore, which I can't do, and why would they be able to do it? Um, I, I don't think, I think, I tell you what, I think the problem that happens then is if you're doing sea, she sells seashells on the seashore, they're so busy working on whether it's a s or a sh that um, the, the rest of pronunciation just gets lost. And so this is why it's better to have something like, um, well, just ordinary language and use that rather than making things too complicated. That's my feeling, at any rate. That's how I feel about. Uh, I, I feel ordinary language is probably better uh, to use. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to make two responses. I'm going to make a response to Sylvia, who said my students can't produce the sound for John. They say Sean with de voicing or Sean, and the wrong point of mm -hmm. articulation. Sylvia, it's a great question, but I think it's a question four question. We a week four question. We're going to deal with sounds and how to work with particular sounds in week four. And if we tried to deal with that question today, now, we just end up saying all the things, you know, it would just take us too far away from what we've done so far. But I am going right. to try to answer what Ivy said. Ivy said that most students in Vietnam have strong Vietnamese act voices. They're too shy to practice pronunciation. Are there any ways to make it interesting and encourage them to do it? So I'm going to get on my high horse here and say two things about that. The first is that when we teach motor sports, uh, motor skills like tennis, what the coach doesn't do when, so should we the coach, say the coach is teaching somebody how to do a serve. What the coach doesn't do is show them repeatedly how brilliantly the coach can serve. You know, the coach can serve at 100 miles an hour and he can do it perfectly. But the coach doesn't obsessively show the students how bad, they're, how bad they are in comparison with him. You know, you'd be crazy. All the children do is do, they can make little gestures and the coach is encouraging. But he doesn't show them how to do it perfectly from the start because that's that's discouraging that, you know, you, if somebody can do something perfectly, you know, oh dear, I'm just going to give up. So as a general point of view, we would say be as silent as possible when you're a pronunciation teacher. Don't give models. Don't show them how brilliantly the native speaker or the teacher can pronounce this. Let them experiment and give them encouraging feedback on how well they're doing. And so that would be one thing I would say, Ivy. Don't model it yourself. Don't give them examples. Let them experiment. And you're the source of feedback for them rather than the person who's giving them a model. And then the second thing I'd say for that is if you teach pronunciation as a motor skill, which is what we're suggesting we're doing, you will find that people love doing it. Every child, I don't know if you're teaching children, 
every child loves to learn new ways they can use themselves, new motor skills. You know, in give a child a skipping rope, wow, for the next two weeks or three months, they're going to be teaching themselves to skip. Motor skills are inherently very compelling and very fun to do. So teach pronunciations a motor skill, a motor challenge, and you'll find that your students will enjoy doing it, will want to do it. Yes, I have a story I'd like to add there. My cousin is, uh, she's actually a violin teacher, and uh, she took all her students one day into a gym and gave them a whole um, ream of A4 paper and said, make yourselves paper planes. And so everyone started folding the paper and making it into paper planes and throwing them around the room. And most of the planes just landed on the floor. Some of them flew a little bit better. And they were experimenting. They were doing all sorts of things. And then she, she actually knew how to do a very, very good paper plane. So she made her paper plane. She threw it and it went across the room and sailed across the room very nicely and everyone was very impressed but the downside was they all stopped making paper planes uh, because she could obviously make paper planes much better than they could now uh, compared to our um, students in, in we are olympic athletes in pronunciation that's to say i've got years of experience pronouncing english and i do it very very well and uh, my students are just coming into this and if I give them a model to copy, then from a psychological point of view, this is really not an attractive thing to do. It's not something that students, um, you know, they're, they're going to be second best every time they do it. There are two of us, and I'm good and they're not, right? So they are the, the worst of the two of us, systematically. And uh, so the best thing to do is to say nothing. You'll have to use a chart because charts are necessary. In this case, you're not going to be giving models. And, uh, and so you have to use a chart so that we, everyone in the class is working on the same sounds, but uh, you can coach people without giving them the model. The model becomes useful once they can um, actually do things, right? Once they can, um, once they can use uh, their articulatory settings properly, once they have their speech breathing a little bit, then, then it can be useful to, to uh, use a model because they know what they're listening for but not at the beginning. Not at the beginning, absolutely, not at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're just- I need to look at some of the questions that are coming up. Okay, so what should we look at next? Uh... Mm -hmm. Does that answer? Uh, yes, apparently it does. That's all right then. Mm -hmm. Okay, people are typing at the moment. People are typing mm -hmm. away. Much. Um, has okay, anybody so got any other questions they're burning to ask? Mm -hmm. We've got some questions for you. If nobody's come up to the question, we're going to throw a question back at you. So if you have any questions, now, now's the moment. Yes. Okay, Ivy, so please Ivy ask. has another question. Please do. And anybody mm -hmm. else as well. Yes. And we can actually move the uh, chat box, right? We can go back and have a look at further up the chat box. Right, there's a, there's a, a lift in the right-hand corner, right-hand side. Wait till I just check okay, back. Well, I just said, yeah, now I find the diff most difficult part is teaching to stress. They like to be very flat or else they raise their voice with no rules. That ends up sounding terrible. Is there any simple way to help them with this? Well, there's two parts of that. One is um, how they actually make a syllable stressed. And the other part of it is where they then deciding, then finding out which of the syllables has to become stressed. And those two questions are called the problem of sentence stress in English and the problem of lexical stress. And they're two distinct challenges um, about learning the language. With respect to sentence stress, which is how do you actually make a syllable stress, most, um, excuse me, that's my telephone ringing in the background, I'll ignore it. Um, with respect to sentence stress, if you look at the last video in week two, we just added a, a video in week two, which summarizes the work on stress and reduction. And one of the points we make in that is that Stress and reduction, as they're implemented in English, are very, very unusual among the languages of the world. Most languages don't use either mechanism to make a syllable more prominent. The, pro the, the typical prominence mechanisms in languages are making a syllable longer or putting a pitch change on it. But in English, and in fact German and a couple of other North European languages, we also have this sense of putting more effort on a syllable and making it louder, which in, in, in running speech is a very unusual mechanism. So almost all languages speak are spoken using full but unstressed syllables. Whereas in English, 
we make most of our symbols either stronger than that or weaker than that. And so this is, this is the challenge, and this is what the week two material has been all about, I think. It's about how to get stress as a physical thing and reduction as a physical thing, because this is going to be the biggest problem for students coming from most languages, and I'm sure Vietnamese is one of those languages. In terms of lexical stress, deciding which syllable is going to receive the stress, I think, I mean, you can go away and you can find all sorts of rules on how this works. But to be quite honest, um, I think Ros can say something or Carrie can say something. I think that this is a case where becoming familiar with the language is the only way to do it. You know, you just have to become more and more familiar with how stress, where stress appears in, on words in English. And this is how native speakers have learned how to put stress on particular syllables. Of course, you just have to have lots of acquaintance with the language in order to get that right. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I would agree with peers. I don't go for rules yeah, as much agree. because I think that uh, if, if, if people, if they give themselves rules, then that's completely different. That's to say if they think, oh, that, that works the same way as this does, that's fine. Because what yeah. they're doing is becoming aware of how the language functions and, and, and good for them. That's excellent. But to say uh, uh, in five syllable words, the stress usually falls on such and such a syllable. If you are just in running speech, you can't come across a big word and say, now, wait a minute, how many syllables this word have? Five syllables worth of this? And, and sort out where the stress should be. You have to just learn the word with its stress. Mm. In the same way as when I learn French words, I learn them with their uh, gender. You have to learn them with their gender in the same way uh, people learning uh, people people learning English they just have to learn the stress with the language right when they mm. learn the word they learn I mean, it with the stress and you'll see I in week four in fact we have a system for this mm -hmm. go ahead Carrie sorry no I was just going to say yeah no no all I was going to say is um, yeah I absolutely agree with you I think there is some value when you're teaching a new word uh, say I don't know biology. And they say, oh, and by the way, words that ending end in ology always stress the oh, <laughs> which I think they right. do. Psychology, biology, you know, you can just flag things like that up, and that I think is quite mm -hmm. useful, you know. Yes, and the way um, I do that is put up on the board archaeology, biology, mm, geology. Exactly. And then yeah. get them to say them, and then they can say, exactly. "Ah, it's always the same syllable." Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. And that's what I do. Where, where there, where, where you can do that, and of course you can't always do that, sadly, because that would be far too simple. But, um, but when you can, then it's then it's a useful thing to do, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a little. I'm going to make a little plug for us, um, and and to encourage people to wait for week four. We we think this problem about. <laughs> teach how to teach the sounds of a word and the stress pattern of a word at the same time has been one which certainly Ros and I have been worrying about for at least 10 years, probably longer. Um, and because as Ros said, when, when, you learn, when you learn a French noun, for example, as part of learning the noun, you have to learn whether it's masculine or feminine. Mm. The two things have to be learned at the same time. There's no point in learning the gender of a noun two weeks later, they get they have to learn them at the same time. And similarly, when learning an English word, you have to learn the sounds and the stress pattern at the same time. And we think we've solved the problem. Um, yes. We, we're probably wrong, but we think we've solved the problem. And in week four, we're going to be showing you a phonemic chart which integrates the stress pattern of a word in an entirely new way, not by using stress marks, which is the way that phon phoneticians do it, but by the way that the, the way the chart is laid out. So um, hold on, hold on a second until week four, and we'll try and help you with the problem of teaching lexical stress in the same way as in week two we've been trying to help you with the problem of teaching sentence stress. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd like to just um, intervene a little bit outside uh, what we're doing here on pronunciation with an experience that I had in Vietnam, where I uh, this is for Ivy. I found that um, uh, one day I realized that my students were thinking of words in terms of, um, uh, well, they, what they didn't realize was that there were classes of words in English. And I was just absolutely stunned. They were learning all these words as separate words, whereas in fact, the, the, the words are all constructed. So what I did was I put on the board uh, vid, for example, and viz, and then we did 
20 or 50 words. I don't know how many we did, lots and lots. So that we that we did visible, invisible, video, um, uh, all the words that have vis or vid as a root, all at the one time. And this was quite a revelation for the for the Vietnamese people in my class, in fact, because they because I think Vietnamese must have words that are one syllable words, and they hadn't realized that all these words, in fact, belong to a family. So that's just a little hint. Uh, mm -hmm. You probably know that already, but it's, I certainly found it very worthwhile doing because these people had not come across this in any way. So we did it for about, um, I don't know, perhaps a dozen common Latin roots, and uh, they, were, um, they were quite surprised and very happy. Mm -hmm. What else have we got here? Wait a minute. Um... Now, if anybody has any other questions, do type them in. I'm just looking, we were going to throw some questions back at you to consider if we, if, if we didn't have any questions here. And one question we wanted you to consider was, do your students learn to pronounce as easily as you did? All, I imagine that all of us here have learned to the pronunciation of one or more foreign languages. So do you find your students, and if they do, well, well the first question is, do you think that your students are as good at, at learning pronunciation as you were, or better or worse? It's now, Silver, when you say no, do you mean they're better or worse? Or um, I, I think they're worse. But, uh, I think they're worse. Uh -huh. so they you don't think listen. they don't listen? Fair enough. Okay. Okay, it's interesting seeing these respond. In a moment, we'll respond, but let's just give everybody a chance to put some responses down there. Do, so the question is, do you think that your students are better learners of pronunciation than you are, or worse learners? And if you have any... Um, if you have any theories as to why that would be, that would be very interesting to hear. If your students are worse than you, why is that? Okay. Sylvia has put in because they don't listen. Elizabeth mm -hmm. is asking is... Uh, they don't hear. Okay, mm -hmm. Sylvia is reckoning that the problem is that they don't hear what's going on. That's certainly true. Donald mm -hmm. is saying it's both. It's how I first encounter my words. Donald, can you say a little bit more about, your, I think you're saying that they, some are better, some are worse. When you say it's how I first encountered my words, can you just expand on that a little bit? Mm -hmm. so Sylvia is saying that students don't hear what we don't hear the language well. Okay, well, that's always nice to hear. It's certainly, while, while everybody is typing, Certainly the conventional wisdom in pronunciation teaching, if you talk to people who are the so-called experts at pronunciation teaching, um, the conventional wisdom is that the problem is that students can't hear the language that they're aiming to, um, they're aiming to learn the pronunciation for. So the, the, the prescription is normally, let's do as much listening practice as possible, let's do hearing practice, let's make sure they can hear what they have to do, and then um, somehow they're going to be able to pronounce it better. And for us, we think there's a bit of a reality disconnect here, in as much as when they've done tests, when academic, when, when universities have done testings of this approach, they find that yes, if you give students, and these are usually very highly motivated um, university students, so they're not typical students in terms of secondary school or the typical students we might encounter, but you get these very highly motivated students, if you give them intensive listening practice, they do get better at listening, or some of them get better at listening. But the problem is, that doesn't automatically turn into them being better at pronunciation. Some of the people who get better at listening do get better at pronunciation as well, but it's certainly not a sort of a linear, oh, if they can hear it, suddenly they're going to be able to pronounce it. And our general philosophy is that we think you should start at the other end with the production side. And if people can start to pronounce something different, can start to do something different with themselves, that will encourage them to become more sensitive listeners. Now they start knowing what they have to listen for, and therefore they become better listeners. So it's two entirely different approaches to pronunciation. Do we try and get them to hear it first, or do we try and get them to produce it first? And um, uh, I think most of us uh, take the view that you should produce it first, but that's not, necessarily, it's not a universal view. Now we've got all sorts of other people coming in. Um, Recognize different accents. That's so clear to me. American, British, Scottish is the same to them. All right. Yes. It's yes. Certainly true that, 
but can I say something in response, Anne? You're absolutely right, of course, that the exam systems, and I forget what the, what the right phrase is, is it called backwash or something, where the, where the exam determines what gets taught and what people are inspired to learn and all the rest of it. So undoubtedly, if pronunciation is tested, people end up not teaching, people end up not learning it. There's one slightly different thing, though, which is that, interestingly, when they do surveys of students, students almost always want to pronounce better. And when they do surveys of teachers, teachers almost always say, oh, no, well, we don't want to teach pronunciation. We don't think teaching pronunciation is very important. And there's a big disconnect between what students want and what teachers want. And our view generally is that teachers don't like teaching pronunciation because it's so unsuccessful. If you try and teach pronunciation through listen and repeat, or in fact, any form of listen first approach, the results are dreadful. And as a result, it gets rather embarrassing. You know, you've done all this work on pronunciation. Nothing has changed in your students. And it's all terrifically embarrassing, both for your students and for yourself. And that's the real reason why we think teachers don't like teaching pronunciation, because they're not because they don't get very good results. Whereas we think if you turn it around and teach pronunciation as a motor skill, as a, through an articulatory approach, you get better results. And students uh, do appreciate that because students do want to pronounce better, is our experience, well, is, is the general experience. Yes. I, I think the, there mustn't be I'd like to say what happened in, in our department. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to say what happened in our department many yeah, years ago. Um, because we. Um, uh, I worked. Can you hear me? I, yeah, yes. I worked in a. Um, in a science, I worked in a science university, so um, my students would give presentations, and we would film the presentations, and we were very, very happy with how well they were doing. And one Christmas, I showed my sister this video of my students doing their presentations, of which we were all absolutely thrilled. And this sister turned around and said to me, but you know I don't speak French. And in fact, we were so used to, in our monolingual situation, we were so used to hearing these, um, this way of speaking. I'm, I'm speaking pre-web, of course, but it was absolutely hilarious. We were so used to hearing the, this stress and pronunciation that we didn't, we didn't realize that a non-French speaker couldn't even understand. And uh, so <laughs> we changed the, um, the system. But I know it's a bit strange, but it's a true story. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, wow. and in 1980, my mother came to visit, and she had learned French at school, and uh, so and she still remembered. She was by then quite an old lady, but she still remembered the poem that she had had to learn at school, which she recited to my French students, and they were incapable of recognizing the poem. It's a very well-known thing. It's by Jean de La Fontaine. It's one of the de La, uh, La Fontaine fables. Very well, well, very very well known to French people, and they didn't even recognize it. It was just so English. And uh, so this is the same kind of thing. This is, this is, there's nothing French about it at all, except, the, I don't know what's French about it, but certainly nothing to do with pronunciation. It was incomprehensible. Hmm? Um, there's the two questions thing. have come in, which I want to, want to just say something about. First of all, Amet has written, a, Amet has written something. And Ros and Carrie, do you want to, perhaps you might just think about what Amet wrote and, and respond to that. And I wanted to quickly, while you're thinking about what you want to say, I just wanted to respond to what everybody's been saying about what Sylvia's here saying about grammar, 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 and what some other people have been saying, Anne was saying about the Korean school system. And I just wanted to mention a concept which you may have heard, but which when you're talking to students or talking to parents or talking to your, your school governors or whatever, might be useful, which is the concept of a so-called gateway skill. And the idea yes. of a gateway skill is that if, if and pronunciation is considered a gateway skill. If your pronunciation is not good, then you can't reveal the fact that you have good grammar, that you have a, a good vocabulary. Because people can't understand you, your general, your overall language skills get downrated and, and they just are not usable. You can't communicate with people because pronunciation stands in the way. And the, the te I say technical, mm. the way this is described is that of a gateway skill. This is a gateway have to pass through before you're able to demonstrate all your other skills in English. So if you are talking to people and they say, you know, oh, we're not going to bother with pronunciation or whatever, the fact is pronunciation is a gateway skill. Without it, everything else falls apart. 
Right. Yeah. Um, Rod, do you want to respond or carry? Would you like to respond to what um, Amet said about his Panamanian students and their conversation classes? Rod, perhaps you first and then carry. Yes, for me, I think uh, my response to this would be um, that it's extremely useful to start with with really just a, 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 a to start heavily on pronunciation in the very, very first lesson and do it for, say, two lessons or, or whatever, the, the, the amount of time it takes. It probably takes about an hour to deal with speech breathing, to deal with uh, articulatory settings, and after that you can start working on sounds, and from there you can branch out into the whole language. So we, we're not up to it yet, but um, because we have to do week three and week four before we can really talk about this, so we'll have more to say about it. But I would say, if, if your students, they know they're bad in pronunciation, you are much better in pronunciation than they are. You're the teacher, and uh, they whether your pronunciation, in fact, is good or bad doesn't matter. But as far as they're concerned, your pronunciation is good, and so the, the they uh, they don't want to be shown up as worse than you are, and so they they don't really want to get into pronunciation. If you say absolutely nothing, then uh. um, then they will respond. In fact. Uh, they will respond if you use a chart, for example, and you can you can sort of oozle them into pronunciation, and they're caught before they realise it. And so we'll have a look at that um, in week four, in particular, uh, what to do about that. But I really think this is extremely important. Don't model because as soon as you model, you're putting them in a in a situation which is psychologically inferior, and nobody uh -huh. likes to be inferior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'd go along with everything Ros has said, and I think if they're if they're bouncing, yeah, I know. I was just saying, I totally agree with what Ros has has said, and and I think you know when you've got a class, I mean, it's 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 more exciting, I suppose, if you've got a multilingual class because then what you get is you get different strengths in different areas because obviously the overlap between the phonemes of uh, British English and the phonemes of whatever language it is are going to be to a greater or a lesser extent depending on, on the L1 um, and then they can bounce off each other and you can get quite a sort of dynamic situation because obviously you know Juan over there is better at that sound but you know Vladimir over there is better at that sound and and that can be mm -hmm. um, a very productive environment but whatever um, you know you constantly making the sound or saying the word, or or, or um, parroting the sentence over and over again in your in your perfect English is not really going to help matters much. Mm -hmm. If you imagine that pronunciation is a motor like skill, then it's a very special motor that's skill. That's Sorry, go, Piers. You you talk. Go ahead, Rose. Go ahead, Rose. Okay. Okay. Uh, Rose. So I speak, you speak, and it's dreadful, but. You want to finish off your thing, and then I'll respond to Natalia and Alex. Say what you want to say. Uh, I've forgotten what I wanted to say. Uh, wait a minute. What did I want to say? Um, I don't even remember. Uh, so it doesn't matter. You go ahead and say what you had to say. Mm -hmm. It was just on the spur of the moment. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, Natalia and Alex. Okay. Natalia and Alex said, we also noticed that if listeners lacking pronunciation, but if listeners lack pronunciation, they have difficulties with listening comprehension. And I didn't um, see that. But this that's is absolutely, absolutely what one would expect. Okay. No, and it clearly is if people don't pronounce right, then their expectation for how the language will sound when other people say it is going to be wrong. And there's undoubtedly one of the huge benefits of, t of learning pronunciation correctly. And in the context of this week's work, it's stress and reduction, and in particular reduction. People who come from a language which doesn't have reduction cannot believe that syllables don't have vowels in them, that they just have little tiny noises, but it's still a syllable. And so they're never going to, their, their expectation when they're listening to native speakers or people who speak English well is that they're not expecting to hear what people actually say. So until people can say, if I, one of our, one of our favorite examples is any sentence which begins the -ra. so there might be the -ra, um, there are three birds over there, or even you can get a, a longer line, the -ra, ra few, there are a few um, pieces of paper on the table, if I'm talking about the, the desk in front of me. So if you have an example like the -ra, ra few pieces of paper on the table, if I deal with French students, they're expecting an English person to say there, ah, a, few, 
or whatever, whatever <laughs> it can be. I'm, I'm, I apologize to any French speakers for that. But nobody expects it to be the r r just those three little the r r few pieces of paper. It's only when you get somebody to pronounce that correctly with that, that degree of reduction that suddenly they're going to hear that everywhere. You know, somebody starts doing that, they'll go out into the street, at, if they're in England or America, and suddenly it'll be as if a curtain has lifted and they're going to hear everybody around them saying, this are this, the r r that, et cetera, et cetera. Start with pronunciation mm -hmm. and listening will improve automatically. Right. And my favorite for starting is uh, starting with the word two. I think Piers put this in a film this week, right? Start with the word two, stutter it, and that gives you t two, t two, and then core, a quarter to two. And they say, it's not true. It's not true. It is true. That's what we say. Just t -t two, like that. And uh, once they get that, once, once they get over the shock, then uh, they learn to do it. They can, they can, it's very easy to do. It's not that it's difficult to do. It's just that it's a completely, totally different concept mm. on what a syllable yeah. has to be. There's and even, and, and even, mm -hmm. even people that have been here a long time. I mean, I was exactly. working with a woman this morning, a, a Polish lady who's um, a civil engineer who has beautiful English, but there are still a few things that elude her. And when I explained to her this morning, that we reduce for to f, and then we activate the r before a vowel, so we get for a few years. I've been here for a few years. She was like, what? And she tried <laughs> saying it, and <laughs> she tried saying it, and she said, that's extraordinary. She was absolutely stunned into silence, because she'd been, she hadn't been connecting it. She hadn't been doing, she hadn't been connecting for, for, a, for a start, and she hadn't been uh, reducing for. So, mm -hmm. I think she'd obviously been hearing it correctly, but that just goes to show the, the to prove the point, doesn't it? She understood it when she heard it, but that didn't mean to say that she was producing it herself because she wasn't. Yes, I've got a student at the moment called Emmanuel. In fact, when I got off this call, when I get off this call, it's in five minutes' time. Uh, I'll be working with her immediately. And uh, she she is having a lot of trouble. She's French. She's having a lot of trouble. She about two weeks ago we had our lesson on Wednesday, and she said to me, "I'm just off a call with my colleagues in in four or five European countries, including Britain," and uh, she said, "I didn't understand anything," and uh, so we worked over some of the sentences that probably were in this. Uh, in this call, because it was she knew what the subject was, and uh, she was there again. It's the same problem. She just cr found it very difficult to believe that there were so many reductions, and that this is what the people were actually saying, and not sh what she thought they would be saying. Mm. This makes a huge difference. I'm going. I'm just having. I'm going to start what we've got here. Yes, I'm going to start the wrap-up process because we're, we're, we've nearly got our hour. I just wanted to say a few things. One is, Sylvia, I suspect that the link you put in the chat box to the Pink Panther is when is where he's she's where the teacher is trying to teach him to say a hamburger, and um, it is a lovely bit of the film, the Pink Panther. If anybody hasn't seen a teacher, the teacher trying to teach Steve Martin, I think, how to say hamburger or to see, to say hamburger in English, it's well worth watching. Um, it's, it's been, this has been our first attempt to do this uh, live room. The only, the slightly disappointing thing is we haven't really managed to get the technology working terribly well in that we've been talking and you've been communicating with us on the chat box. If, how has that worked for you? We would much prefer, of course, to be able to hear you live, but the technology hasn't been terrific from that point of view. It had, from a participant's point of view, could I ask the question? Um, so Beatrice and Anne and Amit and Ivy, is it all right doing this way with you typing, or is it a bit cumbersome, or how do you feel about how this session has gone? I'm hoping there'll be a bit of typing. Yes, Anne's typing at least. Okay. Mm -hmm. Several people are typing. I'll just wait for a moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sylvie thought it was all right. Okay. Yes. It's useful, although you can't say anything. Good. All right. 
if by next time you do have the possibility of finding a microphone and headphones, that certainly would be wonderful because uh, we'd really like to hear you. We would. And um, the way it's going to work is, I'm sure you can all... Oh, no, something's happening. We're getting next. I think Ivy has turned her uh, microphone on. Ivy, do you want to say something? Ivy has turned her uh, microphone on. Ivy, do you want to say something? Yes, I think. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, well, I think the next time maybe anyone can attend by speaking like this. This would be more, you know, interesting. Yes. Mm. Certainly. If it's okay. possible, yes. Ivy. We'll work on that from a. Um, Donald, thank you very much for saying that. Thank you. We have a bad echo, Ivy. Turn your microphone off again. We have a bad echo, Ivy. Turn your microphone off again. Perhaps um, the best thing to do is that to sort of have a, a, a rule or a caveat that if somebody's got headphones and a mic, they can participate by speaking, and if not, then it's better just to type up because I think otherwise we are we might run into some technological issues, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yes, if it's possible to have a microphone, is. that would be really good. Mm -hmm. Maybe. We and of course, we're coming up to one o'clock. I think I think, or one o'clock in the UK time. Um, I think I'm going to wrap it up for this session for this week. It's very nice that everybody's been able to join us. It's, it looks like it can't be, well, I hope it it hasn't been too inconvenient a time for everybody. Um, Beatrice, if you're in Brazil, it must be quite early in the morning, but I guess that's all right, perhaps, if you're an early riser. Mm -hmm. um, Donal, Donald, Donal, okay. I'll, I'll try to get Donal in future. Oh, Donal. Um, Carrie, do you want to say anything Sorry. else, or should we all wave goodbye to everybody? Uh, no, yes, I'd like and... Donald to write his name in IPA because I'm not sure that we're right. I don't know how D O H N A L L is said either, really. So I, I it'll be better to have it in IPA, and then we'll be completely correct. Yes, yes you, could, uh, Donald, Donald, you could you could go back to the introductions and just add it in. That'd be that. Oh, you've got it, Carrie. Say it again, Carrie. Have I, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think oh, I okay. said. We will just have to wait until Donal we'll tells us himself. Donal, Donal. Okay. Uh, Robert has added something. Donal. Clarity of the sound. That oh, doesn't sorry. sound right to me at all. Donal. No, surely not. All right, I'm going to leave this as our question for the week. We all have a we okay. all have a problem now. Which is to work out how to pronounce the Irish name D O N A L. Um, right. Elizabeth, and thank you very much for hosting this, Elizabeth. I'm going to ask thanks, you to Elizabeth. close it down. I'm going to I'm going to wait for everybody to say goodbye. Bye. And we'll see you all next week, Ciao. we hope. Bye-bye. Just with earphones, with uh -huh. earphones, you can speak. Okay. okay. Lovely to see you. Thanks, see Elizabeth. You. See you, Piers. Bye, Rose. Bye-bye, everybody. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Bye.